Hey, we're glad to see you on our another shocking story. Enjoy watching. The phone ringing broke the silence of the night and unceremoniously yanked Pam out of the realm of sleep. She opened her eyes in a shudder, but she couldn't see anything in the darkness. The cell phone kept blaring, lost somewhere in the depths of her bed, and Pam searched for it, fumbling with her hand under the pillow. Her heart was pounding like crazy. She knew that nighttime calls were usually not good. It had been like this at night a few years ago, when she'd been informed that her parents had died in a car accident, leaving their daughter an orphan. Finally, she fumbled for the phone case and tugged it up to her eyes. Jack was identified on the screen, made all the more frightening. Jack was the name of her husband, who was currently on a business trip in another city. He certainly wouldn't call her in the middle of the night. Just like that, for no important reason. Pam pressed the phone to her ear and exhaled anxiously. Hello, Pam. Thank God you answered. Her husband's voice sounded like a muffled squeeze. Unsimilar to himself, she didn't even recognize him right away. Yes, Jack. What is it? Quickly and fearfully she asked. Pam, her husband repeated and sobbed, making her even more frightened. Jesus, Jack, don't scare me. Are you all right? She exclaimed. I'm all right. Yes, he exhaled. Relatively. What do you mean, relatively? Pam, I killed a man, her husband whispered. She clutched at her heart. It would have been too cruel for a joke. Yet, Jack wasn't much of a joker in life. What? Jack, what are you talking about? Killed who? Killed who? She kept yammering. Can you explain? It was a woman, the husband said in a weeping voice. She jumped out on the road before I knew it. There wasn't even a crosswalk. She ran out and right under my wheels. A bump. A jolt. Then I woke up in the darkness and got out. My aunt was lying dead. Pam gasped. Oh my God. How are you? Are you hurt bad? Oh, I'm all right. Jack exclaimed nervously. I'm not hurt. What am I going to do? The car's all banged up. What's that got to do with it? Anyway, he snapped. Did you hear what I just told you? I killed a man. Is she sure she's dead? Pam asked in panic. You checked for a pulse in there, a heartbeat. Dead as can be. The husband confirmed grimly. Where are you now? Pam asked in a drooping voice at the police. Pam gave another gasp. So he's already been arrested. So, what are they saying? Carefully, she clarified. What what? The husband muttered irritably. Guess it once. What else they can say? Heaven is waiting for me in the cage. Bunk beds and prison food. No, Pam mumbled in shock. No, 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 no. Screamed her. That's not possible. I won't let you go to jail. Her husband laughed sarcastically and angrily. You won't. Pam, are you serious? No one's gonna listen to you. The fact of the matter is clear. But you didn't do it on purpose. You didn't mean to hit her. I did, I didn't. That's another question. Manslaughter gets real time too. In case you didn't know, he said, I'm on my way to you right away. Pam assured her, already mentally figuring out what time she needed to be at the train station. The train to the city where Jack was on a business trip left early in the morning once a day. Pam, your coming won't solve anything. Her husband sighed wearily. It will only waste time and money. Don't worry about money, Pam assured him fervently. It is not the main thing. What do you mean it's not the main thing? Jack whimpered. Money can solve any problem even a big one like mine. What? Pam didn't understand. You mean hire a good lawyer? What kind of lawyer? Again, the husband went crazy. Pam, don't you understand anything? I need the money to get my hands on the right people, and then they'll let me go. Pam thought she hadn't heard you, so she asked, will they let me go? Well, yes, the husband confirmed at once, without a trial. Pam didn't understand, Pam continued to ask. How is that possible? Pam, what are you like a little girl? He got angry. Anything is possible for money. 
I've already been told the exact amount. Pam was even more surprised. Just like that. Well, yes, if I can collect the money in the shortest possible time, then I'll be released on all four sides. Just let me out, that's all. Pam didn't believe it again. That's all. What about the relatives? They will probably demand a trial and punishment. What relatives? The husband responded angrily. My grandmother is a lonely woman. Grandmother? Pam asked, confused. What grandmother? The husband was clearly angry. Damn. What else is the one I hit? Pam felt she was confused. I thought you said it was an aunt, and now it's a grandmother. Jesus, what difference does it make? Her husband was finally furious. Isn't grandma an aunt? Or do you think she's a man? Their conversation began to resemble the dialogues from the madhouse, and Pam resolutely cut the silly argument short. After all, it's all the same auntie grandmother, baby. Even a turnip isn't the main thing. The main thing Jack said that he could be released if he could raise the necessary amount of money. How much money do you need? She asked, holding her breath. Five million. Immediately her husband answered, as if he had been waiting for that question. Pam's breath caught. Five million. Wow. The husband even took offense at such a statement. What do you mean? Nothing. Rubles, not dollars. Or do you think my freedom isn't worth five million dollars? What is it, Jack? Pam assured him hotly. Of course it's worth it, and I don't want any money for you, but I don't have five million. And where to get it in the near future I have no idea. Think about it, Jack said, capriciously. You're the smart one. Pam, you have no idea how much I don't want to go to jail. I just can't stand it. I'm going to break down. Of course you would. Jack, Pam could feel the tears running down her cheeks. What a heartless creature she is after all. Her husband, her favorite. The only, the dearest, the closest person in the world was in trouble. Yes, she should break her neck, but to find that money. Instead, Pam whines that there's no money. I'm sure I'll think of something. Jack, she vowed. I will get the money as soon as I can and I'll bring it to you right away. Pam, you are gold. Her husband's voice lightened. He sounded hopeful. I knew I could count on you. I'm going to wait very, very long. When I can get the money together, how can I get in touch with you? Pam clarified. Call me. Jack answered right away. Where should I call? Pam was confused. This number, where else would it be? Jack answered. Pam, are you dumb from your sleep? You're asking the strangest questions. Pam didn't say anything. She didn't understand anything. She thought cell phones were forbidden in the detention center. She thought that Jack had only been given the phone for a single call so that he could get in touch with his wife. And now it turns out that her husband will be on call all the time. What kind of lockup is this? For a second, the stray thought crept back in that this was all some kind of creepy hoax. Hence the inconsistencies in the story and the incomprehensibility of some of her husband's explanations. Jack, she said hesitantly, what about you? I'm sure you're in the detention center now. Do you think I'm lying to you? At once Jack was offended. I'd be glad if it weren't true too. Why didn't they take your phone away? They let me make a phone call. I am legally entitled to one phone call. My husband explained right away, and then they take it away. And then how am I supposed to get in touch with you if they take away your phone? Pam was already refusing to look for logic in what was happening. I'll have the phone handed to me if you call. Right away, her husband assured her. You know they have a financial stake in this. Okay, responded a confused, bewildered Pam. Jack, you do not despair. I'll do everything I can to get you out. I promise. Pan was frantic as she finished talking, to and fro, opening and closing the doors of cabinets, pulling out drawers, and pushing them back in. Thoughts were bouncing around in her head like crazy, one overtaking the other. Should I take out a loan? No, I don't think they'd approve it, she thought. Pan worked in a school and made a pittance. The bank would probably question her ability to pay, 
sell something they didn't need. The words of Uncle Fyodor from the cartoon Prostok Vashino came immediately to mind. To sell something unnecessary, you must first buy something unnecessary. And we have no money. Unless it's some antique jewelry left over from my mother. She, in turn, inherited them from her grandmother. My heart ached. But even after selling all the jewelry, Pam still couldn't raise $5 million. There was only one option left. Sell the apartment. Actually, it was a luxurious three-bedroom apartment, which Pam had also inherited from her parents, and it was worth a lot more than $5 million. But she would have to sell very quickly on short notice. So God willing, if at least the $5 million will be able to get. Pam tried not to think about how she and Jack would be without an apartment. After all, they could live in a rented one. Stuff could be moved into the garage for now, and large furniture could be sold. The main thing is to free her husband, not to let him go to jail. But where would she find buyers so quickly? And then it suddenly dawned on Pam. Mark, her former classmate and good friend, is now an actor in the local theater. He had always had a soft spot for Pam. She even suspected that he was a little in love with her. True, after she married Jack, her friendship with Mark gradually faded. But Pan was sure he wouldn't refuse to help her. At first she wanted to call him right away. But then she glanced at her watch and slowed down. It was rude to wake people up in the middle of the night. We should at least wait until dawn. Pam didn't know how she had survived those few hours. She sat in the kitchen, nervously drinking black coffee without sugar, cup after cup. After waiting for the skies in the east to brighten, she reached for the phone and dialed Mark's number. He answered immediately, a little surprised. Pam, is that you? Yes, Mark, hi. She answered, I'm sorry to call at the crack of dawn. I have something to do with you. Well, it's not really about you. Well, I'm listening. Mark answered eagerly. Remember when you mentioned you had a sister who was a realtor? So, is she still a realtor? Worryingly, Pam asked. Yes, she still is. I need her help. I want to sell the apartment urgently, Pam blurted out. What's the rush? Mark was surprised. It's a long explanation. Anyway, I need a lot of money. Mark was quiet and then asked with obvious concern in his voice. Pam, what happened to you? She hesitated. I can't tell you it didn't happen to me. Mark showed wonders of insight. Then who did? Your husband. What did he get himself into? What difference does it make? Pam was abrupt. What difference does it make if you have to sell your apartment? Pam, I really, really don't like this. And I'm not asking you to judge me or give me advice. She snapped. I just need the money. It's very important to me. You know, I just don't have any other choice. If you don't help me, I'll go to somebody else. Do you have a place to live? He suddenly asked. Pam was at a loss. What do you mean? Well, you said you wanted to sell the apartment. So I was wondering when you sell it, do you have a corner left? Jack and I will get a room. Pam said uncertainly. Honestly, she hadn't looked that far ahead at all. Clearly, Mark's voice grew darker and darker. Pam, listen to me. You're doing something stupid. A really big stupid thing. Staying homeless. It's unbelievable. Doesn't your idiot husband understand that? Why does he let you do this? Don't you dare call him an idiot. Pam got really angry. What else would you call him when he seems to have gotten himself into a lot of trouble and now you're in it? And now he's got you mixed up in it. That's what a man does. Mark said sarcastically. Pam was about to hang up. But he probably realized he'd overreacted. Okay, I'm sorry, Mark said with embarrassment. I really got carried away. I'm just worried about you, you know. I know. Pam answered dryly and brought him back to the topic of conversation. So can you help me get in touch with your sister to sell the apartment? I have to do it right away. How much money do you need? Mark asked. At least five million. If it's more, that's fine. But that amount is enough to solve the problem. Pam. Maybe. Maybe I'll just lend you the money. 
Mark suggested hesitantly. My heart bleeds when I think of you selling your place. You don't have to sell. Just take the money from me. On credit, of course. Pam swallowed a lump in her throat. He was such a good, caring man after all. Thank you, Mark. That's sweet of you, but don't. First of all, I don't know when I can give you that money. You'll give it to me when you can. You can have it in installments. I'm not rushing you, he assured me. No, Mark, Pam said firmly. It's a lot of money. I just can't and don't want to take it from you. It's my final word, not subject to appeal. Well, suit yourself. He skillfully concealed the disappointment in his voice. Then wait. I'll call my sister, fill her in and text her your number. Thank you, Mark. She said with sincere appreciation. You're welcome. He sighed. It was an amazingly quick sale. Pan was surprised at the speed of the sale. She did not haggle. She did not hammer the price. But immediately said yes to the first buyer, who was ready to pay the required amount. Pam signed all the papers without actually reading them. When she received the money in her hands, she even cried from the nervous tension that had finally set her free. Would Jack really be free now? She had been calling her husband all these days, and his voice had grown more and more displeased each time. Couldn't you hurry up, Pam? He sounded reproachful. You have no idea what it is like for me here behind bars. Jack, I'm doing the best I can. Pam excused herself. I'm doing my best. The process is already impossibly fast. But there are rules and laws that just can't be circumvented. The apartment cannot be sold in one day. You're not trying hard enough. Jack was being cranky. And here I am, suffering, chugging, and losing weight. And so, at last, Pam had the money in her hands. She immediately called her husband's number. It was surprising that in the detention center he was safely allowed to use the cell phone whenever he wanted. It was strange. But Pam just didn't have the energy or time to think about it. Jack it all worked out. I have the money, she informed him jubilantly. Great, you could hear the husband's evident sigh of relief. I never doubted you, my love. How soon can you bring them back? I'm taking the train tomorrow morning, Pam said. I'll be there by evening. Give me the address of the detention center. No, no, the husband interrupted. You will have to give the money not to me and not in front of witnesses. I'll give you the coordinates of the place where you'll leave it. They'll pick it up later when you're gone. You know, people are careful. They don't need the publicity. Pam didn't really know much about it. But if her husband said it was best, then that's what she would do. After all, that wasn't the main thing. And when they take the money, will they let you go at once? She asked anxiously. Immediately, my husband swore. In a second, I'll be as free as the wind. And we'll be together again. Pam smiled happily and sniffled her nose. She didn't regret selling the apartment for a second. At least the family was preserved. It is true what they say with a sweetheart in the shack. In the evening, she was busy packing for the trip. The buyer of the apartment was comprehensible and allowed the former mistress to stay here until the end of the month and then move out. So Pam didn't have to rush to sell and move the furniture out. She decided to do it later when she and Jack returned to her hometown. In the midst of packing, the phone rang. Pam glanced at the screen and saw the name Mark identified. Hello. She answered with surprise. Listen, you mentioned you were leaving tomorrow. He mentioned the city Pam was going to. Mark wasn't aware that her husband was in the detention center, but she had told him that Jack was there now. And after selling the apartment, she was going to go to him as soon as possible. Yes. I have a train in the morning. Pam responded. Have you bought a ticket yet? No, not yet. I'll buy one at the station tomorrow. Don't you want to go early? How could I? Pam was surprised. There are trains once a day and no direct buses. You have to change trains. It takes longer. I have some errands to run in that town. I'm leaving there tonight in my car. I could take you with me. We'll be there by noon tomorrow. You will? Pam's excited. That would be great. Thank you so much, Mark. I really appreciate it. 
I would have been a little anxious to take public transportation with that much money. Well, that's great. I'll pick you up later then. How long does it take you to get ready? Pam glanced toward her open duffel bag on the floor. Yes, as a matter of fact, I'm almost ready. Okay, then I'll be at your house in an hour, not my house anymore. With a tinge of mild sadness thought Pam, now that the worries about her husband were generally behind her, she couldn't help thinking about the fact that she had been left homeless, had sold the apartment she had inherited from her parents, had given them her memory. And though she tried hard to convince herself that she simply had no other choice, but still she felt badly. Would her mother and father understand? Would they forgive her? She wore a simple white t-shirt and jeans for the trip, but she still put a drop of her favorite perfume on her wrist and let her hair down. I wonder who I want my husband or Mark to like me. Suddenly she thought and was embarrassed. She hadn't seen Mark in quite some time. After graduation, they moved to different cities. Mark enrolled in a theater school. During his student years, he was constantly running on castings. He took part in all kinds of projects and was filmed somewhere. He was predicted a great acting future. He was called to the movies and the best theaters in the capital after graduation, and he took and returned to his hometown provincial town to enter the service in the local modest dramatic theater. Pan was often at his performances. Mark always gave her countermarks, and she soon learned his entire repertoire. Undoubtedly, her former classmate was too good for this theater. Pam couldn't help but understand that. He was a brilliant actor. He instantly formed the town's fan club, which consisted of females ranging in age from high school to retirement. Mark knew how to win hearts and was good not only on stage, but also in communication with female fans. Always friendly, charming, smiling. More than once watching her friend signing autographs after a performance and taking pictures with fans, Pam felt unprecedented pride for him. She suspected that Mark liked her more than just a friend, but he never admitted his feelings openly or tried to take the initiative in this regard. Pam herself was hesitant to bring it up in conversations with him. What if she was wrong? It would be embarrassing. Mark would think she was a narcissist who thought everyone around her was in love with her. And then she meets Jack. He, unlike the intelligent and not intrusive Mark, just stunned her with his assertiveness and impetuous courtship. Before she knew it, Pam had woken up one morning in bed with Jack and a month later found an engagement ring on her finger. She, of course, called Mark to her wedding, but he came up with some good reason and didn't come. Since then, their relationship gradually fizzled out, which she admittedly furtively regretted. Secretly from her husband, she missed Mark. She missed his wit, kindness, and sense of humor. Missed the theatrical fables, which she loved to listen to him perform. Missed the heart-to-heart -heart talk with no girlfriend was not so great and interesting to her as with Mark. And now she had lost that beautiful friendship. Of course, Pam was a little sad to think about it. And she never went to the theater again. She was afraid she couldn't stand it and would cry. But one gets used to everything. Her longing for Mark grew duller and duller. Gradually, it disappeared altogether. And now, as she packed for the trip with Mark, Pam caught herself worrying. She was really worried and nervous. But it was more of a joyfully uplifted excitement, full of expectation and hope. Pretending in front of the mirror, Pam didn't even lie to herself. Yes, she planned for Mark to like her. She hasn't seen him in so long. And of course, she wants an old friend not to be disappointed at the sight of her. Pam painted up her lips and eyelashes just a little, just to tone them down, and was quite pleased with her appearance. For a second, she even felt ashamed. Her husband is in jail waiting for her to summon him. Meanwhile, she prepares to meet another man, as if she were going on a very real date. A treacherous thought flashed through her mind to wash off her lipstick and mascara and then tuck her hair into a modest, low ponytail at the back of her head. But that's when her cell phone vibrated. Are you ready to go? Mark's calm, confident voice came through. I'm downstairs in your driveway. Maybe I should come up and help you with the suitcase. 
I don't have a suitcase, Pam smiled. It wasn't a big deal. I mean, just a travel bag. Oh, don't worry about it. I'll be right down. Throwing one last nagging glance in the mirror, Pam picked up her bag, turned off the hall light, locked the door, and ran down the stairs. Her efforts were not in vain. At the sight of Pam, Mark's eyes flashed. Pam, he exhaled. You haven't changed at all. Well, no, of course I have. You're better now. Pam blushed and nodded embarrassed. She blushed and nodded in embarrassment. Thank you. They hugged awkwardly, not really knowing how to behave. They had to get used to each other all over again after a long separation. Mark had certainly changed, too. He was even more mature, as if he were taller and broader in the shoulders. Pam looked at him sideways and realized that Mark was a handsome man. Dark hair, fine, aristocratic features, blue eyes, chiseled profile. No wonder groupies went crazy for him. Taking the bag from Pam, Mark put it in the back of the car and then opened the front door, inviting Pam to sit down. She suddenly thought for the first time that she and Mark were going to spend hours alone in the confined space of the car, and she got really excited. Like a high school girl on the eve of her first date, fortunately, Mark himself behaved like a perfect gentleman. He pretended not to notice Pam's flushed cheeks or the way she stuttered and mumbled in response to simple questions. Mark turned on soft music to make it more fun to drive and started the car. Shall we go? He asked, casting a brief attentive glance at Pam. Didn't you forget something? She smiled shyly and nodded. Let's go. Out the windows of the car, first the lights of the city at night, then the private homes of the cozy suburbs. And after endless forests and fields interspersed with occasional lights, a lonely gas station or some distant village in the cabin was warm and cozy. Mark and Pam were chatting excitedly about nonsense. They laughed and joked. They were very easy and comfortable with each other. Mark traditionally delighted her with theatrical tales and amusing incidents. Pam couldn't help laughing when she listened to a story about a crazy groupie sneaking into Mark's dressing room and stealing his socks, or how one day during a performance Mark stumbled and fell into the orchestra pit, but he didn't get confused and immediately jumped out of there, as if on a trampoline. Laughing, Pam wiped away the tears of laughter and asked the question that had tormented her for years. And yet, Mark, were you so successful in Moscow? Everyone predicted a great future for you. You received offers from the best theaters in the capital. You were invited to shoot. Mark frowned faintly. I do not understand what you're getting at. Why did you come back? Pam blurted out. It's not the smallest town in the world, but it's still a country. You'd have to be too small for your talent. His working in the local theater, the peak of your creative ambitions, the limit of dreams. Mark was silent for a long time, not looking at Pam. He was driving, staring at the road. She was beginning to think he was offended at her for being tactless and that she shouldn't expect an answer. I'm sorry, Pam said, just in case. I didn't mean to offend you in any way. If you don't like the question, I'm sorry. Mark threw a quick, attentive look at her. Are you serious right now, or are you kidding me? He asked at last. Pam was at a loss. What do you mean, are you kidding? No, of course not. I didn't mean to make fun of you. I'm really curious. Mark took a deep breath and shook his head, grinning at his own thoughts. Wow, I didn't think you were that blind. Pam fluttered her eyelashes in confusion. What are you talking about? Mark slammed his hand on the steering wheel in anger. Pam, don't you know I only came back because of you? I didn't understand that at all. Pam's mouth fell open in surprise. Because of me? Why? And you had no idea how much I liked you. More than you do, he added. Pam blushed. No, well, of course I guessed. Or rather, suspected, she corrected herself. Though I had no proof, you have always behaved to me only as a friend. But I really didn't know, hotly, she added. Well, now you do, Mark grinned. But was a passing youthful bliss worth the glittering career you might have had? Pam cautiously clarified. 
Mark glanced at her again quickly, but immediately averted his gaze. It wasn't a passing fancy for me, he retorted. It was more than that. Pam didn't know what to do with her embarrassed eyes. It's not easy to keep a straight face when an old friend practically professes his love for you. Even if that love is in the past, and why didn't you tell me then? She asked quietly. Mark shrugged his shoulders. I don't know. I was afraid, I guess. I suspected that if I told you, you'd tell me to go away. You didn't really think of me as a boyfriend. Pam was embarrassed. It wasn't that I didn't. It's just that there were girls hanging around you all the time. I didn't think you were lacking in female attention. If I had told you, would you have reciprocated my feelings? Mark suddenly asked. Pam thought conscientiously. It's hard to say. And how long were you going to keep it a secret from me? My whole life. Mark shook his head in the negative. No. I was going to tell you how I felt before the new year. I bought a ring for you. I had a speech prepared. I was as excited as I've ever been before any of my premieres. And you told me a few days before New Year's that you'd met your Jack. His face twisted into a grimace of disgust. I just did not have time. You fell head over heels in love with me. And then you got married. There was no sense in confessing love. I was too late on all fronts. Mark grinned incredulously. Pam lowered her head. I didn't know any of this, didn't notice. I mean, I noticed, of course, that you were much less in my life. You couldn't even come to my wedding. It's not that I couldn't. I just didn't want to, Mark said. It was cruel of you to invite me. I'm sorry, Pam said. Come on, he smiled conciliatorily. It's all in the past. It's in the past, Pam thought. So he's not in love with me anymore. And the thought made her a little sad. What an idiot. She scolded herself in her head. A selfish fool. She should be happy for Mark. Now he could finally find a girl he could be happy with. But she couldn't be genuinely happy. Sensing that tension was building in the car, Mark suddenly smiled and winked. Would you like some coffee? Pam was confused. Coffee? Did you bring a thermos with you? No. Mark smiled again. But they sell good coffee at gas stations. We'll get something to eat while we're at it. It's four o'clock in the morning. It's about time for breakfast. Pam shook her head. I don't want to eat. I don't want to eat at a gas station. Come on. Mark laughed. Don't you know the magic of gas station food? Pam's eyes widened in bewilderment. No, what kind of magic is that? It's when you stop your car in the middle of nowhere near the first gas station you see, and you buy a coffee and a French hot dog. And it's not a cushy cheap food. You think it's the tastiest thing you've ever eaten. Pam involuntarily smiled at his insistence. The most delicious. I swear, Mark fervently assured her, it's like magic. Let's see. She couldn't take it anymore and laughed. Come on, you talk so convincingly. Mark checked the navigator. Yep. In a couple of kilometers, there will be the nearest gas station. He looked at Pam with concern. You must be sleepy. I've been talking to you. It's been night now. It's all right, she smiled. It's a lot harder for you. You're driving. But it's okay. You've had your breakfast now, and you can take a nap in the back seat for a couple of hours. Finally, the lights of a gas station appeared in the distance. In the pre-dawn fog, they looked mysterious and enigmatic. The gas station itself appeared as if out of nowhere, like a lost island in the middle of the ocean. Mark went to fill the tank with gasoline. He said to Pam, you can get out while you stretch your legs. Pam got out of the car. The morning chill was invigorating. She realized, too, that she was probably a little chilly in a light t-shirt, wrapping her arms around her shoulders to keep her from shivering. Pam paced back and forth to warm herself up. Mark appeared out of nowhere. He was carrying two cups of coffee, the scent of which wafted over her even from a distance. Are you cold? He glanced at Pam and asked in a sympathetic tone. Before Pam knew it, Mark had slipped both cups into her hands. In the meantime, he took off his jacket, also in a t-shirt, and carefully threw it over her shoulders. She involuntarily woke up. 
What are you? Do not. What for? My blood is hot, Mark grinned. I don't feel cold at all. And your teeth are tapping out, and your nose is red. Pam squinted her eyes toward her nose, trying to see if it was really red. But she could tell by Mark's giggle that he was just kidding. But Pam felt so good in his jacket that she didn't argue anymore. The fabric still held Mark's warmth, his scent, and it felt very nice. Pam could barely keep from losing her cheek against the cloth with her eyes blissfully close. What kind of coffee do you like with or without sugar? I took both just in case, Mark informed me. With sugar. On reflection, Pam chose. Then this one is mine. Mark took one cup from her hand and put it to his lips. Try it. You'll see, refillable coffee is really the most delicious coffee in the world. Especially if you drink it at five in the morning. What about French hot dogs? Pam remembered with a smile. That's what you said about them too, that they would seem incredibly delicious to me. Hot dogs are in progress, Mark assured me. I don't throw words around. It's just that hot dog sausages take a little longer than usual to cook on the grill. Pam felt her stomach growl pitifully. Unfortunately, Mark heard it too, but didn't laugh, just commented sympathetically. There you go, and you said you weren't hungry. Be patient. Embarrassed by her embarrassment, Pam lowered her eyes to her cup of coffee and took a sip. The coffee was indeed good, moderately hot, moderately aromatic, sweet, and with just the right amount of creaminess. Pam looked up at Mark as she sipped her coffee and almost gulped. He was watching her carefully with a very strange expression on his face. What is it? Pam looked confused. Why are you looking at me like that? Coffee, Mark said huskily. But then he coughed and repeated. The foam of coffee on your lips. And before Pam knew it, he reached out and gently, gently wiped the traces on Pam's lips. She felt the touch of his slightly rough fingertips. Pam was even more confused. It wasn't just a friendly touch, it was more than that. Or was she just imagining it? Mark, however, quickly pretended that nothing was going on. She had her heart pounding furiously for a long time. Then Mark ran to get some hot dogs ready and handed one to Pam. Come on, check out this food of the gods. Pam grasped and gritted her teeth into a simple, seemingly unthinking sausage bun and almost groaned with pleasure. How delicious it was. It really was the tastiest thing she had ever eaten in her life. Grilled juicy sausage, mustard, mayonnaise, ketchup, and pickles together were a veritable culinary symphony without a single false note. Watching her reaction, Mark grinned good-naturedly. So, was I right? Right you were, Pam nodded. It's insanely delicious. Waiting for her to get bored, Mark glanced at the watch on his wrist. So, let's go. Pam nodded, feeling slightly disappointed. Truth be told, she felt so good and comfortable in Mark's company that she'd even forgotten the original purpose of their trip and where they were going in the first place. Strangely, in all the hours she'd spent on the road, the thought of Jack had never once crossed her mind. Not even once did she think of him. Here, Pam pulled the jacket off her shoulders and handed it back to Mark. It's a great jacket, as warming as a human hug. I'm a very, very bad wife, she thought in remorse as she walked back to the car. Instead of worrying about her husband, who now languishes behind bars, I indulge in gluttony, drinking coffee and practically flirting with a handsome one. What's up with a damn handsome stranger? Are you going to lie there? Asked Mark with a nod, pointing to the back seat. But Pam shook her head. No, I don't want to. I'd rather stay with you. Suit yourself. Mark shrugged, but it was obvious that he was very happy with this choice. It turned out, however, that Pam had overestimated her strength. The car had barely started up and was on the highway. Her head began to tilt back and her eyes began to close on their own. The smooth rocking of the car was killing her, and the soft melody coming from the speakers relaxed and soothed. Pam covered her eyes for just a moment, resting her head on the back of the seat, sitting beside her staring intently. There was such tenderness in his blue eyes, or so she thought. Wake up, sleepyhead, he said softly. We're here.
She jumped up sharply. What now? I don't believe it. How long was I asleep? Six hours, Mark said with a chuckle. Pam felt herself blushing. That's what she said. I hope I didn't go limp. She asked Mark, cautiously. I did, he winked. The car was shaking. Realizing he was taunting her, Pam swung at him playfully. You. With a laugh, she begged his forgiveness. Sorry, you took me on the road. So you were not bored. I ended up falling asleep. I'd be lassy, wouldn't I? Oh, come on. Mark brushed me off. It's not like you're here to entertain me. And then, his eyes suddenly became very serious. I liked watching you while you slept. Pan was confused. Watching. God, what if she was opening her mouth or drooling inappropriately? Not for the faint of heart. She tried to laugh, but Mark shook his head. You're very pretty when you sleep. Very cute when you sleep. Like sleeping beauty. I was sorry to wake you. And there was something so personal and private in his voice at that moment. It embarrassed Pam even more. It was as if she had inadvertently found out some old secret of his. So, as if sensing her embarrassment, Mark tried to defuse the situation. Where can I take you? Where do you want to go? Now, Pam rummaged in her bag and pulled out a piece of paper with an address. It's right there. I have no idea where I've never been. We'll figure it out. Mark assured me, starting the engine again. And Pam felt regret that soon they would have to part. Mark dropped her off at the right house and left on his own business. By the way, Pam asked him what kind of business was waiting for him here. It turned out that Mark had come here for theatrical costumes. The sewing shop in his hometown was closed for repairs. So they had to order new costumes so far from home that they had no one else to send. Pam was surprised. You're not an errand boy, you're a leading artist. Of course I was. It's just that I volunteered, Mark admitted. Why? Because you had to go to that town too. I used it as an excuse to spend a few hours with you, he said quietly. This was getting downright dangerous. Mark was practically blatantly letting her know that he cared about her. Pan was both frightened and pleased by this. But at the same time, she shouldn't forget that her husband was waiting for her. Okay, realizing he had embarrassed her, Mark hastened to change the subject. When you, you're going back, should I bring you with me? After thinking about it, Pam shook her head. No, thank you. We'll make our own way somehow. She didn't want to admit that she was afraid of pushing Mark and Jack together. What if her husband sensed Mark's affection for Pam? Would he like it if some stranger drooled over his wife? It was as if Mark understood the reason for her confusion. All right, have a good one. Thanks for the company. He muttered awkwardly and got in his car and drove off. Pam stood on the road for a while, looking after him. She had a small traveling bag in her hands and she slung it over her shoulder, about to walk around town. She was supposed to leave the money here nearby in an empty box in the thicket of grass by the transformer booth. But the time wasn't right yet, and Pam didn't risk leaving the money unattended much in advance. She wondered if anyone would stumble upon it. To pass the time, she decided to walk around and maybe grab a bite to eat in an inexpensive cafe. It was getting close to lunchtime, and Pam had last eaten at five in the morning at a gas station with Mark. Remembering the delicious French hot dog, the aromatic coffee, Pam involuntarily smiled. She missed Mark. It was strange. She was beginning to miss him already. Pam slowly moved along the street, peering at the signs of restaurants and cafes. Suddenly, she thought she saw her own husband behind the glass of one of the restaurants. Pam even blinked and laughed. She could not believe it. But the man who sat now half turned to the window with his companion, a spectacular long-haired blonde, was indeed very much like Jack. The same short cut back of his head, the same broad shoulders and stout neck. Even the shirt looked like one of Jack's navy blue check shirts. Then she glanced along the cars parked outside the restaurant and groaned again. Her husband's car was there too, safe and sound and he had told her on the phone that the car had been badly damaged in the accident. This one didn't have a scratch on it. Pam checked the plates again. No, there could be no mistake. 
And then the man in the restaurant turned so that Pam could see his face clearly. She almost screamed. It really was Jack, her husband. She refused to believe her eyes, not knowing how to explain what was happening. Clearly Jack must be somewhere else entirely, that is, in the police station. In that case, what was he doing in the restaurant hall with that girl? Pam shifted her gaze to his companion and almost suffocated. The couple held hands affectionately, and her husband stroked her palm quite unequivocally, while the damsel melted into smiles. This can't be happening, Pam told herself. It just can't be. Without herself realizing what she was doing, she reached for her cell phone and looked up her husband's name in the call log. She pressed the call. As she did so, she kept her eyes on the couple in the restaurant. Here she saw Jack take the phone out of his pocket and put his finger to his lips, probably to signal his companion to remain silent. A second later she heard his voice on the receiver. Yes, Pam. He answered. Where are you? Are you still on the train, shaking? Oh, Pam hadn't told him she'd taken the car and was getting into town early. Well, it's for the best. At least now she could see what he was definitely going to keep from her. Yes, I'm on the train, Pam said in an unnatural tone. But her husband hadn't noticed the falseness in her voice. That's good. Are you bringing the money? Of course I am, she answered slowly. Be careful though. He warned her carefully. Don't let go of the bag with the cash for a second. Don't even go to the bathroom with it, you understand. You never know what kind of people you'll meet on the train. That's a lot of money. Do you understand me? You got it. Pam responded with a note. Jack, where are you now? Where? Jack's voice sounded confused. In a cell behind bars, of course. I see. Pam stretched out, looking at him almost at point-blank range. But the husband and his companion didn't even think to look out the window. That's it, Pam. Come on by, said Jack. I'm not allowed to use the phone for a long time. So at six o'clock in the evening, bring the money to the agreed place. All right. All right. A little sluggish, Pam said. That's a good girl. Kisses. See you soon. And Jack was the first to press off. For a few seconds, Pam watched stoop fightly as her husband put the phone aside. Something merrily tells his white-haired companion, and she grinned merrily. There was no doubt that they were laughing at her, at Pam. And though Pam still didn't understand much, anger at being cheated forced her to act. She resolutely stepped to the restaurant door and opened the door, trying not to let Jack and his blonde friend see her. She slipped quietly to a nearby table. They were separated by a rink with a lush exotic palm tree, and it was possible to sit quite side by side, but not see each other. That's what Pam needed. She sat down at the table next to hers, all ears open. Soon a waiter materialized beside her table, politely inquiring what she would like to order without raising her voice. Pam, silently, without looking, poked at the first line on the menu. The waiter nodded and left, and Pam listened again. Don't you think, she guessed. The companion of her husband's companion whimpered. Who is Pam? Asked her husband, again, and chuckled. Oh, really? She's naive, simple, like a village idiot. She can be sold any nonsense. She takes everything at face value. She's a fool, that's for sure. The blonde giggled. What's the matter with you? She believes you and runs right off to sell the place. It's unbelievable. I bet you didn't. The husband said ponytailedly, I put on such a show in front of her, just like a theater of one actor, and about this grandmother, which allegedly hit told, and about the fact that I was immediately taken and brought to the detention center, chatterbox. The girl remarked with a laugh, but now all that money will be ours, Jack said contentedly. We'll take it and get out of here. No one will find us. What if she goes to the police? asked the blonde with doubt. Pam to the police. Oh, don't be ridiculous. The husband laughed again. On the contrary, she will hide her shame from everyone. That's her nature. Ashamed to admit that her husband ran away. And no one forced her to sell the apartment. All by herself, all voluntarily, and with a song. 
prove later that I forced her to do it. It would soon be evening. The girl dreamily stretched out. I cannot wait to get our millions. Listening to this nice talk, Pam involuntarily clenched her fists so that her nails dug into her palms. Fun for them, so they are glad that they were able to fool around. Already mentally plans for what will spend her millions. Well, it's not going to happen. Pam's first impulse was to jump up from her desk, walk up to the couple, and pour the soup down their necks. But she immediately dismissed the idea. The effect would be short-lived, and there was no guarantee that Jack wouldn't take the bag of money from her out of spite. That was something she shouldn't allow to happen. No, she had to be more subtle and clever. Without waiting for her order, Pam left a bill of money on the table. She grabbed her bag and hurried out of the restaurant. Once outside, she hesitated for a moment, but then dialed Mark's number. He answered at once, as if he had been waiting for her call. Yes, Pam, something's wrong. Are you all right? She took a deep breath and blinked rapidly to hold back the tears. No, I'm not okay, she said honestly. Mark, I really, really need your help. And Jack was beside himself with joy. It had worked out even better than he had planned. His fool bought the practical joke, didn't doubt its veracity for a second. She immediately rushed to sell the place. Doubly stupid, by the way. He would never sell his own place if he had nowhere else to go. However, the apartment was registered in her name anyway, and he was still registered at his mother's. So there was no point in him claiming the apartment, and so at least to get some money from the apartment. True, Pam was a real bargain, but it was her own fault and he could use the money. Him and his pretty Alice. When Jack met Alice, he knew he was lost. The girl was perfect. Everything about her was perfect. Her face, her figure, her voice, her gait. Except that Alice hadn't given in to his advances right away. It took him a long time to woo her. He saw that she was used to expensive gifts, spectacular signs of attention. She needed money, a lot of money and where to get it, if he worked as an ordinary clerk in the office. And Alice was getting cranky. I want to go shopping abroad. I want vacations by the sea. I want to eat lobster and lobster in the shade of palm trees under the murmur of the ocean. And Jack knew he had to act. He had to get the money no matter what. A lot of money at once, and then take dear Alice to the tour operator, and then to the jewelry store, wherever her heart desired. Alice came up with the hit-and-run plan. Clever girl. She's a clever girl. As good as she looked, the wife immediately took the bait and promised to get the money. Conscience did not torment Jack. After all, it was Pam's own fault for being so naive. Anybody else would have checked the information a thousand times, and this one flew right out to the rescue. Serves her right. Jack was on his way to the place where he was supposed to pick up the amount and then let Pam wait till she was blue in the face for him to be released from the detention center. She won't. Even if she went to every detention center in the city, she wouldn't find him there because Jack had never been there. He was terribly pleased with himself and whistled merrily with his hands in his pockets. He decided to walk to the place so as not to flash his car around town. What if Pam saw it? He told her the car was a wreck, and there was the cherished transformer box, next to which a cardboard box lurked in the grass. That was where Pam was supposed to put the money. But no sooner had Jack taken a couple of steps toward the box than he was blocked by a strange old woman. She did look strange. She was dressed in some sort of ancient rags on her head, a fringed scarf, a huge hooked nose, like Baba Yaga, bushy eyebrows. She looked like a fairy tale witch, and Jack felt even uncomfortable. Murderer, the old woman proclaimed, pointing a crooked finger at him. A cold sweat broke out over him. What on earth are you talking about? Grandmother, he asked her cautiously. Have you gone completely insane? You murderer. The granny repeated clearly, hit an old woman on the highway and drove away left her for dead. Jack thought he'd misheard her. I hit a woman. What kind of nonsense is that? It's not bullshit. I hit her. 
And now you want to pay off the justice system with money. Jack's cold. Could it be that crazy Granny had somehow found out about his plan? I didn't run anyone over, Granny, he said nervously. You imagined it. I didn't shoot anybody down. Granny protested. Then why did you send your wife away to help you out? Why did you make her sell her apartment? Murderer. She repeated in a stern voice. Jack felt sick to his stomach with a bad feeling. He rushed to the cardboard box, stuck his hand in it, and almost howled with despair. It was empty. Enraged, he turned to his grandmother and yelled frantically, flashing his eyes. Where is the money? You old witch. Did you steal it? I didn't steal it. She shook her head. I just took what was owed to me. What do you owe me? He clenched his fists in fury. What for? It was you who knocked me down. Granny's eyes gleamed madly. You took my life. And you decided to pay me off. You're crazy. Crazy, for sure. It flashed in his head. Give me my money, Granny. He roared and rushed at the old woman. But the old woman, with an ease unexpected for her age, turned and mumbled back. It's my money you killed me. I have to have it. Jack swung to strike the mad old woman, but she forcefully intercepted his outstretched hand, making him blink in surprise. Where did that dandelion of God get so much strength? I didn't kill you. I didn't kill anyone. He shouted in despair. I told my wife I did. She wagged her finger at him. Yes, I lied to my wife. I lied. I just needed the money. He shouted it out. So I played a trick on her. Bravo, Jack. Suddenly a mocking voice came from somewhere on the other side of the bush. Pam stepped out of the bushes. The practical joke was a success. I gave him a standing ovation. I believed it. Pam. Jack turned pale. I can explain. No, you don't have to explain. She shook her head. I know what I want to know. Get the hell out of my life, Jack. I never want to see you again. I never want to see you again. Jack finally realized that it was his money that was crying. Nobody's going to give him five million dollars. He's been played like a sucker. And who did? Pam's a patsy. And she got some broad to make it look good. Jack looked back at the old woman in a rage, and he was stunned. The old woman was transforming before his eyes. Here was her back straightened, and the old woman immediately became taller. Her long hooked nose was unhooked. Here somewhere disappeared wrinkles gray oakleys. And finally, before Jack's astonished gaze appeared a young and strong man. Thank you, Mark, Pam said, turning to him. You're welcome, Pam. He replied in a completely normal, not mumbling voice. It was even nice to remember my college days, when I worked as Baba Yaga at Matinee's and school Christmas trees. Mark. Well, Mark, of course, Jack remembered. Pam had an old friend, an actor, whose name was Mark. What a sly creature. She was putting on an act for him. And he thought she was a knave wiretapper. So that's how it is. Jack looked bitterly at Pam. You take me for a fool, Pam. No more than you take me for a fool. She's the one who's got the ball. I catch on the fly and learn fast. Jack realized he was in trouble. Now he had no wife, no money. And that meant no Alice, because she would never forgive him for screwing up like this. And he has no place to live either. Pam, he said softly. Oh, don't sulk. You've got it all wrong, sweetheart. Let me explain. Pam looked at him with a strange expression on her face, a mixture of pity and contempt. You don't have to explain anything to me, Jack. She said at last, just get out of my sight forever. What do you mean, disappear? Jack was quick to declare. You are my wife, and I am your husband. Pam shook her head. I ask for a divorce so that your spirit in my life no longer. Jack was about to argue something to the contrary. But he met Mark's stern warning glance and dropped dead. Didn't the girl make it clear to you? Asked the damn actor. Get out, or I'll give you a kick in the butt to speed you up. Jack didn't wait for the kick. Once more he glared unkindly at his wife and her companion. He slouched down and walked away quickly and humbly. 
As her husband's figure disappeared, Pam took a deep breath and noticed that her knees were trembling slightly. It wasn't easy for her to have this conversation. But most importantly, she felt no regret or bitterness, only frustration for having wasted years on this insignificant man. She gave him love and attention, care and warmth. Let him go. Good riddance. Happy liberation, Pam. Mark winked at her. You did good. You're starting a new life with a clean slate. Congratulations from the bottom of my heart. Pam grinned bitterly. I know. What a clean slate. No husband, no apartment. The girl's a bum. Mark folded his arms across his chest and made a puzzled face. Well, your apartment is still there, I suppose. Pam fluttered her eyelashes in confusion. How so? Mark shook his head. Oh, Pam, Pam, how can you be so frivolous? You should have at least looked at what documents you signed when you were drawing up this so-called act of sale. To be honest, I really did not read it, Pam admitted. I didn't really care. Besides, I trusted your sister. She's an experienced realtor. That's what my experienced sister had you wrapped around her finger at my fervent request, of course. Mark winked at her. Pam clutched her head. Wait, I don't understand anything anymore. So did I sell the apartment or not? Of course not, Mark replied. How could I let you lose the place your mother and father gave you? What was in those papers? Pam asked, confused. It was just a rental agreement. And who did I rent it to? She didn't understand, she said. Mark laughed. To me, through a proxy, acting on my request. She thought she was going mad. You, Mark, what's in it for you? I've always wanted to live in the same apartment with you, Mark stated seriously. But his eyes were laughing. But you know, to sit in the living room together in front of the TV and tell each other how the day went. To cook breakfast, lunch, and dinner together fall asleep and wake up on the same bed together. Pam didn't understand what he meant at first, but when she did, she blushed like a beat. Will you accept me as a guest, Pam? I am a very, very decent, responsible tenant. I don't throw socks. I don't wash dishes. Oh, come on. Pam couldn't take it anymore and laughed. The tension gripping her muscles finally released. Mark, is the apartment really still mine? My God, Thomas the Unbeliever. Mark rolled his eyes. Yours is yours. But then where did the money come from? Five million, she remembered. He shrugged and smiled. Well, since you refused to borrow it from me anyway, I had to squeeze the necessary amount out of you at least that way. Pam's eyes went wide. So, in essence, you were willing to give me the five million dollars without getting anything in return. Mark, why? Why would you do that? He shook his head and looked at her with sadness and tenderness. You are so inscrutable. I would have done anything for you, even give my life for you, let alone some lousy millions. Pam sniffed her nose. Thank you, Mark. You're so good. You're the best. You've helped me so much. But this, she handed him the bag of money, embarrassed. I don't need it anymore. Mark winked. Why don't we spend it on our wedding and honeymoon? What? Shrieked Pam. Mark, laughing, put his palms up. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Although, you know, Pam, I'm not really that much of a joker. You know how I feel about you, right? I do. She said quietly, with her head down. I'll always be waiting for you, Mark said seriously. All my life, if I have to. I know how to wait, I'm patient. And one day, one day you'll say yes, I know. Pam took a cautious step toward her friend and gently ran her hand over his cheek. You won't have to wait long, she whispered. I agree. I have only one condition. Condition? Mark asked again. Pam smiled slyly. Well, yes, promise you'll do it. Anything for you, Mark swore fervently. I want us to go on our honeymoon in a car. So, Mark stretched out still not fully grasping her thought, to stop at gas stations in the middle of the night and buy a French hot dog and coffee, Pam explained. Mark was stunned for a second, then laughed in relief and pulled her to him. Pam, you're just crazy. 
And then he finished. That's why I love you. And Pam hid her face against his chest, embarrassed because she wasn't used to the fact that Mark wasn't just her friend anymore. Much more. He's her whole world, her whole universe. The most reliable, the most loving man in the world. And of course, she would soon learn to love him the way he deserved, the way he himself loved her, devotionally and sincerely. From now on, she'll be fine, because a man like Mark just won't let her feel bad. Not a chance in the world.